<laughs> there we go. Praise God. All right. Yeah, well, okay. So Dave, listen, um, well, not to jump ahead of you, you're the host, but I do want to thank you for inviting me on. Uh, I I really appreciate you you giving me the time here and um so usually I had like to have a lot of fun. I like shooting from the hip, if that's okay. Yeah, great. Uh well, that's probably the best way. Yeah, but use banks, huh? Um so yeah, I, I'm I'm very glad that you accepted my uh my email as well. Um <laughs> I never thought I'd be talking to a Jesus freak on on YouTube, but uh, there's a first time for everything. Yes, yeah. sir. <laughs> um, so, yeah, let me just start with a quick introduction. That, that uh, My name's David Stanley. Um, for over three years, I, I've run a, um, a, a, a spiritual journey group, a very small group, yes, one-on-one -on -one really, um, and uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, it's it's sort of, it's out of the, the, the Christian uh, concept, it's more broader, and it's, rather than being based on the Bible, it's based on Pilgrim's Progress. Do you know that book? Pilgrim's Progress? Yeah. Yes, sir. I, I know about it. Yes. Yeah. What, what mm -hmm. do you think of Pilgrim's Progress? Well, um, what, what I find is interesting in its in its um, presentation, it's almost like uh, layers of parables. It's like Jesus taught in parables. Exactly. And, and in, in that, what's that? Exactly. Uh, Jesus taught in Yes, yeah. and and the reason he tells the reason why is so that it because it's only for you. I think I'm echoing. I th it's only for you to understand and not for them. And so, um, the fact of the matter is, is that without leading of Holy Spirit, we can't even really understand the scriptures. And and for for an author to write a book that is metaphors similes parabolic parables uh based on the christian story <clears throat> excuse me um i actually think that's great uh as a matter of fact writing my book if you were to read my book you you i i present a lot of things almost like a parable it's i just a second Yes, sir. I'm too busy, okay? Just, I uh, just had to, somebody was knocking at the door. Oh, yeah. sorry. So in my book, it's, it's, it's not so much metaphors and, and parables, but what I write is in a manner that the, the reader has to think and ask. I, I write at the end of sections. Paul's pray and ask Holy Spirit to tell you what it is you've just read, to explain it. And like Pilgrim's Progress, uh, like Scripture, without the leading of the Spirit of Truth, we we can't really understand such things. the The Scripture says spiritual things are di are discerned spiritually. Right. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I've, I've got a, a spiritual philosophy. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so um, yeah, it, 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 as long as you know where you are with God, then things should work out well for you. Amen. Yeah. Well, and you know, remember you yeah. mentioned I'm a Jesus freak, right? So, um. It's never my intention to browbeat someone with the Bible. As a matter of fact, even the Most High God in Deuteronomy says, I place before you life and death, blessing and curses. I ask that you choose life. So think about this. The Most High God 
asks that you choose life. He gives you the choice, right? It, it says that you've still got free will. Yeah, that's correct. And and so you can say, well, you know, this Jesus thing, I, I'm not interested. I don't I don't want none of that. I don't want the free gift of God um, that that provides the only way to eternal life. Uh, I, I'm not interested in that because I I don't really want to believe that. Um, and and so that's OK. You have the option to do so. One of the other things that that kind of grinds my gears, I'll hear people say who don't have understanding in these areas is that, well, why would a good God send people to hell? And the fact of the matter is the most high God does not send anyone to hell. They choose it. They choose it by not choosing him. If you don't choose the creator, the life giver, you, he doesn't send you there. You've chosen it. What other option is there? Either eternal life with him or eternal death. Yeah. Well, what other? Yeah. Um, I was in a congregation with, with the pastor for one or two years. And um, he, he made me his assistant the assistant pastor, if you like, mm -hmm. um, because he was French and I, I was English and wanted an English speaker. Yeah? Yes. And um, I would always argue during his sermons that um, a different way of looking at it. And mm -hmm. I would present a uh, different scripture for him to look at it differently. And he used to get so angry. And then one day, one day he, he 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 said to me, "Do you think you are better than me?" And I said, "I said, I said, no, not at all. I just see more clearly than you." Yes. Yeah. Yep. You know, I I, I get um, I've got I've received been the brunt of those comments from other men. You know, the way we say things actually matters, right? and how we present it. And one thing, David, I've learned, you know, you and I, we, we started communicating via email and text only. And, and, and you gave me a bit of your, your testimony and your introduction to me over email. And, and I was, I was, I was moved listening or listening, reading your, 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 your brief testimony. And I told you, I found, I found parallels, connections in both of our lives. Um, I was born with cerebral palsy. Most people, I blow it off. My whole left side is atrophied. Okay. And I, I have a pretty pronounced limp. I hate seeing myself walk across the stage on, on video. I, you know, I, I'm sorry. I, I hate might be too strong, but it's, it's uncomfortable because I look so clunky, you know, and and that Dave is really is pride, isn't it? It's pride that I'm embarrassed that this is the body that God has given me, and and um, and so and I share in your in what you mentioned, you know, about having pain and about all these things. Also, you had tons of 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 really varied experiences, you know. You you know the movie Forrest Gump. Yeah, definitely. Forrest Gump was like this, you know, the guy was just dropped into scenarios haphazardly and, and he's just there, you know, and, and, and quite frankly, my life was a lot like that. I, I, uh, I was going to sound, I don't mean to sound pompous, but when I was growing up, there was a test that we used to take in the States and it was, it was a, it was a, a test of your of your mental capability of, of your intelligence and it wasn't an iq test it was a little, it was quite different from that and it was impossible to get a hundred on it and i was in the news in california because i was the one kid ever that got a hundred on it and and so it was kind of a big spiel and they they were doing all kinds of weird tests on me and trying to figure out how i could do such a thing uh i was around 11 12 years old that and um, what's that? You didn't cheat on the tests. No, no, sir, not at all. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, 
like I told you earlier a moment ago, is I, I like to shoot from the hip. So, and even in those things is I, I just have a knowing. I can't explain how I understand how things work. I, I, I just know. Yeah. And, yeah. And, but that scenario, I played guitar for a living. I played country music for a living. I played on ch country chart records. Okay. And I played with world renowned, literally world renowned musicians. If there's any musicians out there, if it, you probably know the name Victor Wooten, he's a bass player. I played and performed with him. Now I'm not a, the same caliber as, as such a musician, but their talents certainly rub off when you spend years hanging out with them. And then I got into IT when this new thing called the internet came out. Uh, it started that I knew how to fix computers in a recording studio and they started going to digital audio. And it was very expensive to just have two tracks of digital audio in a studio at this point. We're talking 1985, 86, okay? So I'm in a studio, something would go wrong. I knew how to fix it. I just knew. That led to more and more me being involved in technology and in the computer realm. And then believe it or not, one day I get a phone call from NASA. I'm at home. I get a phone call. It says Goddard Space Flight Center on the caller ID. At the time, I was working for a contractor at Aberdeen Proving Grounds where they make VX nerve gas for the military. And I was doing tech support out there. This was in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. I get a phone call. And it's this lady on the other end, and she saw my resume on the inter on the internet. Now they didn't have job sites then, David. They I had just placed my very thin resume on the then internet on a free free website post. Uh, they were called uh, not Alta Vista. That was a search engine, whatever they were called. Anyway, I placed my resume there. She calls me because she found me there. And during the conversation, I fixed her computer. She was having a problem with a server while she was calling me, and I fixed the problem while we were on the phone. I told her what to do. I, David, I was hired. This this is literally how I got my job at NASA. So they, I'm talking about like like Forrest Gump. They make a phone call. They found my resume in the internet. They make a phone call. I fix her computer server on the, she says, can you meet us for lunch the next day? They off, they asked me how much money did I need to make? And they, and they took me to lunch and that the rest is, was my history. Uh, I worked at NASA for 12 years. I, because of my willingness to just do whatever someone would ask me to do, I got connected with a guy uh, named Mike Comberiati, who goes by the moniker NASA Mike. If you search NASA Mike, you'll find him on the internet. He's retired. NASA Mike, Mike Comberiati, would do special projects initiatives. So we would go out around the world, do things like the first webcast from the North Pole on, on a floating sheet of ice and put ground stations on, on polar orbiting spacecraft for at McMurdo station in Antarctica. Uh, and then I would get farmed out to other project scientists because they knew I could just kind of do whatever they needed. I could just do it. And so uh, one time, one project scientist said to a group of people, well, I could take the five of you or just take Dave. And, 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 and so it was less expensive to just take me. And uh, and so I spent a month in the uh, Antar the the Amazon basin on a meteor, a study of a meteor impact that was discovered in 1984 by a Landsat spacecraft. Uh, no humans had ever been there in the jungle canopy. Uh, it was a very dangerous, exciting. We had National Geographic with us, taking photographs and. Uh, Everyone got sick. And so that became, that was my job. That's where you're at, where you at this week, Dave. I'm in that brings up a, a very interesting point. Did you find evidence of a meteorite? What, the way they find evidence of a meteorite, well, first of all, Landsat saw a, a, what looked like a giant circular blotch 
Now, understand, it was under the jungle canopy. The way Landsat would see it is in a multi-spectral imager. It, it didn't see a, a impact mound or, or, or hole. It, it saw a difference in the foliage and an analysis of infrared information and all that reflecting back off the jungle canopy. So, so that folks don't think, well, it's all a hole in the ground. It's, it's not how it works. And the reason I'm saying that is because the way you would study an ancient meteor impact in the jungle is you got to look for materials that are not indigenous to the soil in that area. Uh, 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 metallic type materials, elements that aren't indigenous in the soil. And, and so we had a magnetometer in a in a in a, a drone a, a Cessna like drone a big yellow airplane I got pictures of it online, and we flew that drone in a grid to study the 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 magnetic differences to map out where this supposed impact was. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now I I watched a video from from Vibes of the Cos uh, Cosmos, mm -hmm. um, and they they. Uh, they put forward the theory that up in the upper atmosphere, gases coalesce in, into balls, mm -hmm. and these balls get so heavy that they come down and they look like meteorites. Yeah, we 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 can get look like no, they are meteorites, right? <laughs> well, I, well, they don't come from outer space. Uh, well, we we can go right there. Let's go for the throat, right? So I worked for NASA for twelve years. I taught satellite data processing uh, 101, uh, not deep level stuff, big beginning stuff. Um, again, I was mainly a, a, a technology support person, but I was working on projects that were off the chart. And so I was involved in a lot of the science and the technology, the two go hand in hand in many ways. And, and, and because a lot of people want to, you know, you work for NASA where you're not a scientist. Well, okay. How many people in this room have worked for a Nobel Prize winning astrophysicist? Raise your hand. How many people in the room have been to the North Pole? Been there more than once. It, it, I, I pull this on people. Is The fact of the matter is, is whether I was a rocket scientist or not is, is, is immaterial. I, I, I worked rubbing elbows with all of that ilk all of them and why I, again because they they could use me in their efforts when they're doing field science it to that end i believe at what we were all taught dave yeah. uh, if they, I were happy, they were happy uh, to employ a christian as well. well well but christian wasn't really uh was a that was an aside, and and I wasn't much of a Christian, even when I first got saved. I was still playing guitar in bar rooms and getting drunk. Quite frankly, uh, Holy Spirit was working on me. And um, again, you got to keep in mind this is over twenty years ago. Uh, working on twenty five, probably maybe more. I don't know. Time flies, but. The whole the question of faith wasn't wasn't really uh, an issue in that scenario. What what it is 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 we all grew up in a classroom, in our education systems that puts a globe in the classroom. You walk into that room as a child. There's a globe, and you and your teacher would call you up. You know the moments that you're 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 able to communicate such things, and she'd call you up and say, "Hey, David, show us where we live here." I was in California, and you would spin the little globe, and you point your finger down. And I was lived near the Bay Area, and I point near San Francisco, and that that's where we live. And I'd get an applause, right? And so that scenario gets embedded in your psyche. Plus, you get rewarded dave you okay. get rewarded can i just say one thing about the globe sure. yeah now the globe is just an object really but right. but people put a lot of love into it they, they love their globes yeah yes mm -hmm. and they put a lot of adoration towards it now when yeah. evil spirits see 
um, that you're adoring something, they come in and they possess it so mm -hmm. that they can get the, the, uh, all the love that, that you're giving to it. Yes, so, absolutely. So, so um, in a way, we need to come up with a way to, um, to do an exorcism of the object. I okay. love it, Dave. Yeah. Listen, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I, I teach that kind of scenario often that the, 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 the globe as an object and as an image is, is, is an idol. It is, it, it has become an idol to the nth degree. And you're right about the demonic who want to seek worship so they get they come between you and that image right and and so not only that though in in our education systems we're taught knowledge that exalts itself against the knowledge of god and so somehow even though i became a christian while i was well before i was at nasa but growing in my faith and and sanctification we still squeeze Copernican cosmology into Genesis. Somehow we were able to force, you know, the idea that we orbit around Helios and that there's an orbital plane for all the planetary bodies and, right? This is gonna run out pretty soon. So oh, it's gonna run out. Yes, so we can do another one if, if you want, I, I, uh, a follow up. This can be part, part one. And I, I, it'll take it'll take two minutes to send you another link, if you want. Well, uh, you could stop. Um, okay, let's go ahead and start. We'll we'll leave it at the Copernican cosmology thing and come back in at that. How about that? Fine, fine. Okay. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, so stop recording. See you in two minutes. Okay, buddy. <laughs> 